Hello. Thank you for joining the Health Effects Institute 2020 webinar series. We hope all of you are safe and healthy during this challenging time. My name is Annemon van Arp. I'm Acting Director of Science at HEI. I would like to acknowledge Hannah Bogart, Principal Scientist at HEI, who co-organized today's session. As you may know, we are holding five webinars in lieu of the HEI annual conference that was planned in Boston this week, but had to be canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. We are very grateful that the session speakers and chairs have agreed to give webinars instead. We would also like to acknowledge the hard work of our staff who work behind the scenes to transform the annual conference into a webinar series. In particular, Paula Vipant, Eliane van Vliet, Robert Shavers, and Joanna Kiel. Today's session chairs are Jennifer Peel, Professor of Epidemiology at Colorado State uh, School of Public Health and Department of Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences at Colorado State University, and Kiros Berhani, Cynthia and Robert Citron, Rosalind and Leslie Goldstein, Professor and Chair of Biostatistics at the Maryland School of Public Health at Columbia University. They're both members of HEI's review committee. Before we delve into the, today's webinar, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. Hold all questions until the question and answer period at the end. Questions should be submitted via the Zoom Q&A function. You can add and upvote questions to the Q&A section at any time during the webinar. If you have any logistical questions, please let us know via the chat box. You can also email us at jkeel at healtheffects.org. This session will be recorded and will be available on YouTube in the next few weeks. You will receive an email with a quick survey afterwards. We appreciate your feedback. Finally, registration for the next webinars will be posted soon. Today, we're kicking off the series with the webinar, The Big Deal About Big Data, Causal Inference and Accountability Research. Today, we will take a close look at accountability research, which evaluates the effectiveness of air quality interventions in improving public health. We will discuss the role of big data, how accountability research can contribute to evidence for a causal association, and approaches to synthesis of the evidence. We have a really great lineup of speakers for you today. I will now hand over the mic to Dr. Jennifer Peel, who will introduce the first speaker. Hello, thank you, Anna Moon, and welcome everyone. Our first speaker is Dr. Doug Dockery. Uh, Doug is an emeritus professor of environmental epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health with a distinguished career in air pollution epidemiology. Some of his most recent research evaluated the effectiveness of environmental controls in improving health, including evaluations of the effect of coal bans on mortality in Ireland, effects of reduced fine particle concentrations on life expectancy in the United States, and the effect of workplace smoking bans on myocardial infarctions in adults and asthma in children. So I will turn it over to Doug with a reminder for everyone else to mute their mics, please. Thanks, Jennifer. Let's see. Uh, is my screen showing now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So accountability. Uh, what is accountability? Let's see. For us academics, we often ask the question, uh, what is the relationship between exposure to pollution and health outcomes? So this is a very, this is the tr traditional epidemiologic view. But for the policymaker, they're asking a very different question. What is the relationship between a regulatory action and health? And for that, we need to start looking backwards to ambient air quality changes, changes in emissions, and ultimately to that regulatory or other action. And this is what we call accountability studies. And in 2003, the HEI organized a, a meeting which came up with this paradigm, the chain of accountability, to, to pull this all together. And it provides a nice framework for us to think about uh, these studies and how they all fit together. Now, over the past two decades, there have been quite a few studies on accountability, 
and in fact, leading to a whole series of uh, reviews of this uh, area of literature. And it's not my intention to review the, the literature in total here, but rather to think about what this means in terms of empirical designs and where we, what we've learned and how we go forward with this. And specifically, you know, we think about randomized controlled trials as our gold standard for causal associations in observational studies. But we also have data from quasi-experimental studies, that is where we have natural experiments. We have uh, policy evaluations where we look at policy uh, implementation and subsequent changes in health status. And more recently, uh, th this development of methods to randomize post hoc uh, observational studies using big data. So we're gonna talk about, I wanna talk about all of these. And specifically, you know, if we start with randomized controls trials as our standard, the concept is we would take a, a group of individuals and then the investigator would randomize those into those who would receive the cleanup, the intervention, and those who would receive no cleanup and no intervention. And the concept here is that if we randomize then, we would have two comparable groups to work with. And we follow those people up, uh, monitoring their health status, and ultimately compare the results uh, of those two, uh, within those two groups, which are theoretically uh, comparable. Uh, generally, this is not feasible for environmental studies and actually not, usually not ethical, but we do have some examples where this has been applied most specifically in the case of uh, interventions to provide families with improved uh, open fires for improved fires for cooking. So uh, in a randomized controlled trial in Guatemala led by Kirk Smith and colleagues, they randomly assigned families to receive an improved stove with a chimney to remove the smoke from the home, the kitchen, and followed up the children in both of these groups with uh, weekly visits by a nurse and follow up with a physician to diagnose any respiratory illnesses. And the study was remarkably effective in reducing PM 2.5 concentrations to these extraordinarily high values in the control homes to reasonable levels in the intervention homes, a reduction of uh, 96%. And in fact, the rates of physician diagnosis pneumonia decreased from 63 per 100 child years to 50 uh, in the, with the intervention. So this was very positive. But on the other hand, when you look at the reduction in the exposures of 96% versus only a 20% reduction in the health outcome, it was somewhat disappointing that we did not see a more substantial effect. And what was the reason for this? It's illustrated here in this picture uh, from my friend, colleague John McCracken, and showed that really what happened was, although the kitchen PM levels dropped by 20 fold, the actual exposure of the children only decreased by about two fold because kids don't spend their entire day in the kitchen. And in fact, the chimneys were simply taking the smoke from the indoors and putting it outdoors where uh, it was still a community hazard and children were spending their time indoors as well as outdoors. So when we think about this in terms of the uh, accountability chain, uh, the emission, the intervention was very effective in reducing emissions, uh, reducing kitchen PM 2.5 concentrations, but actually less effective in reducing the exposures of these children and less effective in reducing the overall health burden on these kids. So there have been uh, substantial lessons learned from this and improved designs for soap stove replacement studies have been undertaken. And I think Jill is, Baumgartner is gonna talk about that somewhat in her next talk. What about natural experiments, these quasi experimental designs? Here we would have a, a pre-intervention observation period and then there would be some intervention of some type uh, leading to a, a cleanup. And then uh, when that ultimately, uh, there is a rever uh, reverting back to the original conditions. 
And so examining the health status of populations in these three different time periods provides some indication of potential mm -hmm. benefits. So the classic example here is in Utah Valley, uh, where a steel mill in this high altitude valley was producing a lot of uh, air pollution uh, during winter inversions. And between July 1986 and August of 1987, the workers went on strike closing the steel mill, but this led to very substantial improvements in the air quality uh, during the strike compared to the winter before and the winter after the strike. And Arden Polk uh, examined the rates of admissions for children to the local hospitals and showed that those admissions dropped very dramatically during this time period also, uh, providing very visually compelling evidence that there was uh, an association here between improved air quality and reduced uh, respiratory problems, respiratory admissions uh, for children in the community. So the intervention here, uh, the strike in fact, led to very clear evidence of improved air quality and also very suggestive evidence of improved health in the population. On the other hand, there were other things going on at the same time. Clearly, there were economic effects in the community, potentially loss of medical insurance of the workers, lost population, and so forth, which might be alternative explanations for the change in the health status, not for changes in the ambient air quality. So this is a clear example of what we would consider to be confounders in a traditional epidemiologic study. For these intervention studies for the accountability studies, we, we would call these counter changes in the counterfactual in that, do we really know what would have happened? Is this really investigating the effect of the strike or other things uh, through air quality, or is it through uh, other things that might be changing in the population? Another example would be the 1996 uh, Atlanta Olympic Games, where there were interventions in terms of trying to reduce traffic within the city of Atlanta during the Olympics. And uh, Friedman and colleagues examined this, uh, examined traffic counts during the Games, changes in air pollution, and ultimately asthma emergency department visit. And what they found was that Morning peak traffic indeed dropped by about 23%. Uh, they found evidence that air pollution declined in the Olympic period compared to the weeks before and after the, the Olympics, uh, most notably for ozone, but also for other pollutants. And they found evidence that the rates of asthma emissions uh, from various sources uh, were lower during the Olympics than uh, in the comparison periods before and afterwards. And this was true on a variety of sources. So it suggested that there were some benefits here in terms of uh, improved air quality and also improved uh, health of the population. Uh, Jennifer Peel, our chairman, uh, followed up with an extended analysis of these data looking at uh, similar outcomes, although looking at emergency department visits uh, they also found that ozone levels dropped during the admitted the Olympic period compared to the period before and after, and also compared to uh, the same weeks in the years before and after the, the Olympics. They also found that pediatric upper respiratory infections declined during the Olympic period compared to the periods before and afterwards, and also compared to uh, the same weeks before in years before and afterwards. But what they did also observe is although ozone levels dropped in Atlanta uh, during this period, they had also dropped in all over the Southeast United States as shown by data here from uh, Augusta, Columbus, and Savannah. So this was not strictly a period, a effect of the uh, traffic ban, traffic interventions, but was a regional phenomenon. And so, in fact, was breaking this chain between admissions and air quality 
and suggesting that the observed effects really could not be tied directly back to the traffic interventions. So more broadly, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, policy interventions uh, put in place. And the question we want to address is whether we can actually detect these benefits. So for example, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we looked at uh, the effect of a ban on coal, ban on coal burning in Dublin uh, during the 80s, there were very high levels of black smoke pollution in Dublin associated with burning of coal for domestic heating. And on September 1st of 1980, the government banned the sale of coal within the city of Dublin. And this had a very dramatic and immediate effect on black smoke concentrations uh, over the, uh, in, the, in that winter and succeeding winters. And the question was, does this lead to any improvements in health? Uh, we looked at mortality uh, over the same time period, and you can see the seasonal trends and the high levels, especially in the winter time. And after the ban, it looks like there has been a decrease in mortality in Dublin. So the question is, you know, what is the counterfactual here? Do we look simply at the mean numbers of, uh, mean death rate before the ban and extend that to the post-ban period. And if that's the case, then it looks like there's very clear evidence that mortality rates have gone down. But many other things have been happening in this same time period in terms of delivery of healthcare, uh, behavioral factors, and the economy and so forth. And the question is, what would we use as a counterfactual in this case? And so we looked to other counties in uh, Ireland, which were not affected by the ban, to see whether they had similar effects. And if we plot uh, the rates of mortality in other counties, unaffected counties, in, in the middle of the country, uh, overlaid on the top of what we see in Dublin, it becomes apparent that there was this overall long-term trend uh, across the whole country that was independent of the effects in Dublin. And in fact, we really could not separate the effect of the ban on coal sales from the long-term trends, the long-term improvement in health in the population. So although there very clearly there was an effect of the coal ban on coal sales on air quality, uh, we could not make this leap, this connection to the human health effects, at least measured by the mortality rates. Because you know, we have this question of what is the counterfactual, what are the demographic trends, the healthcare trends, the behavioral factors, as well as the other climatic and seasonal inf infections and so forth that might be influencing this. So the question is how do we develop a counterfactual in evaluating these effects? So Ted Russell undertook this looking again at the city of Atlanta and evaluating the effects of various power plant and mobile source controls that had been put in place in the Southeast uh, between 1999 and 2013. Estimated the emission reductions based on actual emissions and the implementation, the actual implementation that went on in this period. Uh, calculated then the daily air pollution from the emissions meteorology that would have been expected if these uh, control strategies had not been put in place. And so it was able to compare what was actually observed over time with what would have been expected if the controls had not been in, put in place. And then estimated the daily emergency room visits based on time series of these data uh, and then applied that to the counterfactual estimated air pollution concentrations. And finally, uh, differenced the observed respiratory and cardiovascular emergency department visits compared to what was expected from the counterfactual and developed these estimates of how many uh, respiratory and cardiovascular emergency departments were avoided as a result of these interventions. So this shows the 
what could be done with this, but it also shows how difficult these types of approaches are. And, you know, really illustrates uh, one of the beauties of many of the other studies where you have a very clear intervention and, and clear outcome. Uh, here, it's actually a lot of modeling and it, it uh, makes it, uh, it's a very, very challenging approach to take. An alternative might be to think about, well, are there intervention communities that we could look at? And to think about, well, are there other communities where there, were, there was no intervention? And so to try and provide this direct comparison between different communities with and without uh, interventions over the same time period. And this is what uh, Arden Pope and Majid Azadi and I attempted to do in uh, an analysis of life expectancy uh, across the United States. Uh, we identified 200 or 50, uh, 51 metropolitan areas across the United States where we found data for PM2 point concentrations uh, going back to 1990 and matched with concentrations measured in 2000 uh, spread all across the United States. And if you look at life expectancy in the, around 1980 in those communities versus the PM 2.5 that was measured at that same time for these uh, 250 counties or the 50 metropolitan areas, you can see the suggestion that as air quality, as PM 2.5 went up, life expectancy went down. So we have a cross-sectional association most of these communities were above the standard that was subsequently set in 1997. If we jump ahead 20 years now to uh, 2000, what's happened is that air pollution has dropped. Many of these communities are now in compliance, but life expectancy has also gone up. Uh, but interestingly, you still see this cross-sectionally, this association suggesting that as life as air pollution goes up, life expectancy was down even in 2000. And if we take the difference in life expectancy and compare that to the change in uh, PM 2.5 concentrations as shown here for each of those communities, this difference in difference analysis, then we see that in the communities with the biggest reduction in PM 2.5, we saw the suggestion of larger reductions in life expectancy than in the communities with small or effectively no change in air quality. There was less uh, increase in life expectancy. And overall, there was about a 6.6 .6 year increase in life expectancy associated with each 10 micrograms per cubic meter of PM 2.5. So in this case, we're not looking back at any specific regulatory action, but the net effect of multiple regulations over this two 20 year time period. Uh, we did observe a, a mean decrease of 6.5 micrograms per cubic meter in the PM 2.5. And overall about a 0.4 year increase in life expectancy associated with this. But again, the, the question is what about other behavioral, contextual, demographic changes that might be affecting human uh, health response here? And the, I mean, what we were trying to do was uh, examine different communities, assuming that these factors would all be operating similarly. Uh, but it's not entirely satisfactory. Alternatively, if we think about the whole population, large populations. Uh, and the concept we were trying to develop is that there, within the population, there are people who are going to be experiencing an intervention and other groups of people who would be not experiencing this intervention. And so is it feasible to think about selecting groups within this who some of these people who are matched in terms of the same characteristics? So the job of the investigator is trying to match these populations with the intervention and those without the intervention with uh, matching those with similar characteristics of age, sex, race, smoking histories, 
body mass index, uh, history of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, obesity, whatever, as you think about a large number of predictors or potential confounders here. And with a large enough population, you would think it would be possible to match people in the interve uh, intervention group with someone in the non-intervention group. And if you could develop these groups, then follow them up and compare the results. And so this is like a randomized control controlled trial in that you've now random, you have different interventions, but now you've matched these people to reduce the uh, confounding or other covariates. So this becomes an analog of the randomized trial. So Corey Ziegler and Francesca Domenici uh, attempted to do this, uh, looking at the impact of national ambient air quality non-attainment designations on health in the population. They identified uh, 800, almost 900 PM monitors in 2005 in the Eastern United States and classified these into those that had attainment, were in attainment of the standard, the PM 2.5 standard, and about almost 300 that were in non-attainment. So the being designated as non-attainment means that they have to take various actions to try and come into compliance. So theoretically, there would be an intervention associated with that. And then they match those with 10.5 million Medicare beneficiaries who lived close to those monitors. So they lived within six miles of one of these monitors. So here they've identified groups that are potentially in an intervention, that is a attainment area or non-attainment area versus a uh, non-attainment area that controls. So the concept is that the intervention there is this non-attainment designation in 2005 and match groups of Medicare beneficiaries living within six miles of these attainment or non-attainment PM 2.5 monitors to predict the PM 2.5 that would have been if there had been not this designation and then to predict the mortality if this designation had not occurred based on the Medicare uh, and compare that to the mortality uh, based on the actual Medicare data. So with these 10.5 million beneficiaries living close to these monitors, uh, you can divide those into those who were in the attainment area versus the non-attainment area. There were clear differences between these areas. Uh, I mean, as you would have expected, they were higher PM 2.5 concentrations in the non-attainment versus the attainment area. They also were more likely to be uh, in non-attainment ozone areas. Uh, as we expected, the mortality rates were higher in the non-attainment area than the attainment area. Uh, the hospital admission rates for cardiovascular disease were higher and for respiratory disease were higher. But these groups were also different in terms of uh, being more urban, being more minority populations, having higher household income, uh, difference in a large range of uh, difference of uh, characteristics, which somehow we want to adjust for. And the way they approached this was developing a propensity score for each of these groups uh, based on the uh, PM 2.5 monitors and people living around those. And this is an aggregation of the probability in being in one of these non-attainment areas uh, based on all these characteristics. And then matching these groups, identifying groups that had similar net propensity scores and matching those. And then you want to eliminate any of the areas where you cannot match them based on what those underlying characteristics are. So this uh, shows the, the difference. These are all the characteristics that were evaluated for each of these attainment and non-attainment areas. And you can see that there were large differences for some of these parameters in the PM 2.5 and the uh, urbanicity and so forth uh, before matching, 
But after you match these and prune them down to the ones that have good matching, in fact, then you are able to remove the differences between these uh, two groups and effectively attain a sample of uh, the intervention, non-intervention, or non-attainment uh, attainment areas, which are comparable. And when they did this, then they were able to match 183 non-attainment areas, that is the intervention group with 221 attainment areas, 5.5 million Medicare beneficiaries. They were able to show that there was a small decrease in the PM 2.5, not statistically significant, but interesting that they could see this. And likewise, a small, de well, a difference of uh, 1.3 deaths per hundred, per thousand rather, person years, uh, not quite statistically significant, but again, very suggested that something was going on. So to me, this is important because this non-attainment designation is clearly a very weak intervention. Uh, you wouldn't expect much to be going on there, and we don't see much happening in terms of PM 2.5, but we do see some suggestion of benefits. It really suggested that there is improved air quality and reduced mortality associated with this, and really provides a model for an innovative approach for assessing national interventions, given the big data sets uh, that we're talking about now that are becoming available. So, you know, looking back on all this, we think of uh, randomized control trials as a gold standard for causal associations. Uh, there are really practical limits to its application in air pollution, although there are some uh, special cases where it is being applied. The quasi-experimental studies are really only effective for short-term effects and really depend on, depend on infrequent and unique interventions. The post-hoc post analyses of policy evaluations look at the long-term uh, effects, but the, retro the uh, counterfactuals are very difficult to define in these analyses. And these randomization of observational studies matching using big data, I think, show a lot of potential for showing long-term benefits of long, large-scale interventions. So what are the lessons? I think uh, these studies are asking the right question, the right question for policy assessment. Uh, the designs can be intuitive, and the beauty is they really are very accessible. Uh, when they're done right and, and shown well. Uh, the modeling and statistics actually are not going to save us here. I don't think they're going to compensate for weak study designs. Uh, defining the counterfactuals really remains very challenging and the biggest hurdle we have to deal with. Traditional randomized trials really have limited applicability in, in this field. And I think evaluating accountability studies based on the criteria for these clinical trials is really not going to be very helpful. And we've had some discussions about that in the literature. On the other hand, big data offers some real opportunities here. And I think we still need creative designs and potentially taking, care of the, taking advantage of the big data with some of these new designs. So the road forward, you know, I think uh, there are some opportunities and, you know, given where we are now, uh, I think creative thinking might be able to lead us in, a, in new directions. So thank you, HEI, for your leadership in this and for organizing this workshop. Thanks, Doug. Um, as a reminder to all the, all the attendees, uh, please submit your questions uh, via Zoom, and we will have a question and answer panel discussion at the end of the, the talks. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Jill Baumgartner. Dr. Baumgartner is an associate professor and William Dawson scholar in the Institute for Health and Social Policy and the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Occupational Health at McGill University. She is also an associate member of the McGill School of Environment. She studies exposure to environmental pollutants and their effect on human health in the context of urbanization and development. 
She is currently conducting a study in China to evaluate the effectiveness of a coal ban and heat pump subsidy program in improving air quality. So I will turn it over to Jill. Um, great, thank you, Jennifer. And hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes, you sound great. Perfect. Um, so uh, I've been asked to talk about this, uh, these topics in the context uh, of settings where household biomass and coal stoves are uh, important sources of air pollution and, and including talking about um, some of the challenges of, of conducting research in these kinds of settings. Um, so for people who uh, are not familiar, household air pollution generally refers to pollution that comes from household biomass and coal stoves, also called solid fuel stoves when they're used for basic household practices, cooking, heating. Um, and it's a risk that largely affects poor communities. Um, the highest proportion of homes are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. Um, about 3 billion people use solid fuel stoves as their primary household cooking source. Um, and it's important to, to just note that the estimates that are often shown for this, they, they, they don't account for secondary fuel use uh, that, that are using solid fuel stoves for other purposes than cooking, um, which we know is really common. It's also um, uh, any secondary fuel or, or um, secondary stove use. So it's likely underestimating global exposure to, to household air pollution. Um, incomplete combustion of biomass and coal emits lots of pollutants that, that have been shown to be bad for health. Um, carbon monoxide is the most commonly measured pollutant for decades, um, but studies over the past 10 years have largely shifted to measuring PM 2.5 given its importance for human health. I, I think a, a common misconception is that household air pollution is an exposure that's in this completely different range from outdoor uh, particulate matter. Um, and the data really tell a different story. So this is a this figure shows that individual exposures to um, log transform PM 2.5 and carbon monoxide from a, a number of household air pollution studies that were conducted in seven different countries. Um, and these this line uh, shows the WHO guideline. Um, and so we, we basically pooled all of these different studies. Um, and then this red color indicates the, the range of yearly average outdoor PM 2.5 from the world's 500 most polluted cities. And so while most of these exposures to household air pollution are higher than the WHO guideline, um, and they are a lot higher than uh, outdoor PM 2.5 in high income countries, um, there's actually substantial overlap with outdoor PM 2.5 in some of the more polluted urban areas. Um, very few studies uh, have looked at chemical analysis or source apportionment for household air pollution. This is a review that we did in 2017. Um, so in this figure, the circles represent the proportion of PM 2.5 from household air pollution um, that was uh, in a, a household air pollution study that was attributable to both uh, different indoor and outdoor sources. So two of these are urban studies, uh, but the majority of them are rural. Um, biomass and coal stoves are shown in red, so they're sort of the bright red circles that you see. Um, and for all the limitations of source apportionment studies, uh, these show that household stoves are certainly an important source contributor to indoor PM 2.5 and exposures, but they're not the only source or even the largest one. So sources like trash burning, traffic, and dust, they're also uh, important sources of pollution in, in places where people are using these stoves. There's been decades of development to try and uh, develop biomass stoves that are less polluting. Um, this is showing emissions of uh, PM 2.5 and carbon monoxide from different types of stoves. Uh, most, but not all, um, are actually less polluting than an open fire, um, and none have really been as low polluting as gas-fueled stoves. So I think, um, at least in the health community, gas and electricity are increasingly viewed as really the most promising interventions for achieving large reductions in air pollution. But as you'll see in my presentation, a lot of the work has been done on, on biomass stoves to date. Um, there's been really two directions that have been used in epidemiologic research to improve causal inference in household air pollution. The first was really focused on conducting observational studies with personal exposure measurement. And the idea that would be that these would enable us to determine the pollution reductions that would be 
um, necessary to achieve a, a health benefit in, in these different settings. Um, and uh, this is showing on the left-hand side the existing re exposure response studies that have been done in settings of household air pollution. So there are a number of them, uh, but it's obviously far fewer uh, than the hundreds, if not thousands, that have been done for outdoor and urban air pollution. So overall, there's about 20 that have been done. Um, the most commonly assessed outcomes were respiratory infections and blood pressure. So those are two examples of, story, of uh, studies that were done um, on the, the right-hand side of the screen. Um, I think a much larger number of studies have used stove type as an exposure metric. Uh, I'm not going to present on those here because of time. Um, I think they certainly contribute to the evidence, but it's really hard to understand what stove type means for exposure uh, in a lot of settings, given, given the variability that we see in emissions from different stove types that, that even have the same name. Um, and it's highly, often highly uh, correlated with lots of confounders. So residual confounding has been an issue in a lot of those studies. Um, the main challenge for exposure response studies uh, has really been exposure assessment. It's hard. Um, the air monitors that are used are expensive, they're bulky, um, even the best ones don't have a battery life for longer than 48 hours. Um, they tend not to be very robust to uh, harsh field conditions. We'd actually, uh, Health Canada had used uh, a number of monitors for over a decade um, and had, uh, was, was uh, changing the type of monitor they were using, they donated them to us. Um, and most of those monitors broke within the first four months of use in a high air pollution setting. Um, surrogate measures like uh, indoor measurements, those have been found to pretty uh, poorly correlate with exposure in a lot of settings. Um, and the, the part of the problem is they still have the same logistical constraints. So you still have to, to deal with monitors and settings where there may or may not be electricity. Um, and outdoor monitors fail to capture indoor sources. Um, biomarker research thus far has been really limited um, in large part due to some of the cultural and logistical constraints in, in doing these measurements. Um, so as a result, the, the policy for household air pollution has been largely driven by integrated exposure response models. Um, these were developed by a number of people who are, are likely on this call. Um, and they combine exposure response relationships from different sources. So looking at outdoor air pollution, secondhand smoking, and uh, smoking studies, and then combined with household air pollution when that, uh, those data were available. Um, notably, these models uh, suggest that the curve is flattest in the exposure range that almost perfectly overlaps with uh, the range that we observe in settings of household air pollution. So meaning that pre precision and exposure measurement, it matters even more than for outdoor pollution settings um, that, that we tend to see in high income, uh, in high income countries. So the second area of research um, that, that was pursued for causal inference was uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, so as Doug mentioned, the idea is that these would be free from confounding and, and would allow for measurement of the, the pure energy intervention effects. Um, trials are obviously quite expensive. Um, they typically are just a few years in duration. So this um, limits or often limits studies to acute outcomes. Um, but that being said, the ones that have been evaluated have been really important for global health. So things like childhood pneumonia um, and birth outcomes. I just want to note that there's a, a massive ongoing effort to trial LPG stoves in a, a multi-country trial of over 3,000 homes. Um, this has a number of outcomes, including severe pneumonia. Um, the investigators for this study have gone to enormous logistical effort to try and implement measures that capture all parts of the accountability chain that, that Doug was presenting. So I think the investigators will be able to evaluate not only the total effect of, of the intervention, but also how it impacts health. Which is, which is quite important for um, understanding how these interventions actually work in the real world. Uh, thus far, I think it's funny when putting together this slide, um, 
it looks, it actually looks worse than I had anticipated in putting it together. Um, and hopefully I didn't miss any uh, of these uh, studies that did find uh, an effect or a positive effect on an outcome. But these are the randomized trials of clean stove interventions that have been conducted to date. Um, there's been eight of them, uh, and most of them have trialed improved biomass cook stoves. Um, so most of them did not observe an effect of the stove on their primary trial outcomes. Um, though a number of them did show benefits for secondary outcomes like blood pressure, uh, neurocognitive impacts in children, severe pneumonia. Um, so these are certainly important from a global health perspective. Uh, but I think overall the results of, of trials and many other intervention studies have been, uh, have been disappointing. So I don't have time to get into the details of all these trials, but um, I'll specifically discuss two that I think highlight some of the overarching uh, challenges and lessons learned. Um, so in the last pre presentation, um, Doug had referenced the randomized control of a biomass stove in Guatemala. Um, as we learned from his talk, the contribution of, of community pollution may have masked some of the benefit of the intervention. Um, but another issue is that these stoves still did pollute into the, the homes. Um, so they weren't um, as low polluting as we would like to see. Um, and I think one of the smart aspects of this trial is that it, uh, it both measured exposure so that they could evaluate exposure response relationships as well as the intervention effect. And that's been very informative uh, to policy. Um, I also wanna mention this trial in Malawi. So this is the, the largest trial that's been conducted, I think, to date. Um, in, in it, the investigators rolled, enrolled over 10,000 homes in Malawi, um, and they also looked at the impacts of a biomass stove on uh, childhood pneumonia. Um, to avoid some of the community pollution issues that they had seen in Guatemala, the intervention was implemented in village clusters. Um, and I think most uh, concerning about this particular trial is that the stove actually led to a, a borderline significant increase in severe pneumonia in the intervention group. Um, data on air pollution weren't published uh, with the results of the, the study. Um, so it's not clear what actually happened to air pollution, but they did collect information on um, stove use in a subsample of homes. And I think that's quite interesting because it shows that not only were the intervention stoves not used very often, so by the second year they were used for less than half of a cooking event per day on average in households, um, and they also broke quite a bit. So um, each intervention stove was, was uh, broken on average three times during the course of the study. Um, and these have been issues that have been sort of persistent uh, across different intervention and trials that have been done. Um, I think, at least in the field of household air pollution, we're starting to ask the question of whether or not it's really realistic to expect that a single stove can, can meet the, the diverse energy needs of, of households. Um, so often trials are, are trialing a single stove, um, but obviously you know, people use different types of stoves for cooking different types of foods or for heating or, or for even lighting in some settings. So um, this figure is showing the number of cooking devices plotted against the total number of energy devices in Chinese homes. So these are data that were collected in 2017. Um, and you know, only three of the 856 homes um, had one energy device, uh, and only 26 homes had um, you know, one energy device, but then multiple other uh, heating or, or lighting devices. Um, so again, speaking to the fact that people are using lots of different stoves uh, and stove types to meet their, their needs. Um, so I, I think in theory, we are able to conduct randomized trials more easily in household air pollution than, than for outdoor air pollution, um, but they still have a, a number of limitations. Um, Quasi-experimental approaches, I think, uh, have been used less frequently in household air pollution than in, in the ambient air pollution or outdoor air pollution literature. Um, Doug mentioned the, the coal ban, uh, Dublin coal ban study, which is one example of a natural experiment. Um, another well-known natural experiment with household air pollution is 
one that used uh, regression discontinuity to estimate the effect of uh, a heating policy in China on air pollution and, uh, and life expectancy. So on the left-hand side, um, so that line that is separating northern and southern China um, is known as the heating line. So above that line, heating is subsidized. Um, so coal heating specifically is subsidized and below the line, um, it's not. And so the researchers looked at both um, ambient PM10 levels, um, but then also life expectancy in people that were living just above that line versus those that were just below. Um, and they found a three year difference in life expectancy uh, between those with subsidized cold heating versus those without. Um, though in this particular study, they weren't able to control for other regional differences um, as they were in some of the studies that, that Doug was showing earlier. Um, a study that we're currently involved in is evaluating the, the Beijing coal ban. Um, so in this case, uh, Beijing has designated coal restricted areas in 2017. Um, and then they also started offering subsidized electric heat pumps and subsidized electricity. So in 2017, they required 2 million people to stop use of coal um, and then implemented the, the subsidy. Um, and then they've expanded this now to uh, a potentially 63 million homes uh, in northern China, where they have a stepped implementation over a five-year period um, where they're implementing this program. Um, one thing that we looked at in a cross-sectional uh, evaluation, so this is a pilot study that we did, where we enrolled uh, high-income, middle-income, middle and uh, uh, low-income villages uh, in three different parts of Beijing. Um, and we found that while the high and middle income villages um, had nearly fully transitioned from coal to electricity, um, the low income villages, uh, they were still using coal um, and really struggling with that, the cost of that transition. And I think these distributional effects of policies, they're really poorly understood. Um, often for trials and investigator intervention studies, they're often powered for, um, they're seldom powered for subgroup analysis. So we don't really have an idea of how these uh, policies or how these interventions affect, for example, low income households versus high income households. Um, and we also haven't done a very good job of evaluating whether or not there are detrimental effects of these policies. Uh, and I should mention that we have a, we're now doing a longitudinal evaluation of this program um, in about a thousand homes in 50 villages. Um, I think an exciting development over the past few years is that there now are an increasing number of national energy programs um, like the China coal ban. So they're all stepped in their implementation. So they do allow for quasi experimental study um, in addition to the study that I mentioned in China. Um, in India, there's an ongoing program to provide free LPG connections for tens of millions of families. Um, so, switching gears a bit to big data, um, I think these, these large-scale programs are generating lots of new data on energy, um, and these can be leveraged by researchers. Um, so this is an example of a study that was done uh, by researchers at University of British Columbia, where they collected data on the sales of gas for homes that were both enrolled in an LPG um, subsidized LPG program and homes that weren't enrolled in the program and they were able to evaluate um, use for those two different groups um, finding that people that were in the subsidized program they had increased their LPG use but it certainly wasn't to the same amount as people that were already enrolled in the program and I think that the question is whether or not it might be possible to leverage this type of data um, to evaluate space-time trends in energy use and outcomes, um, similar to the example that Doug had presented for the US, um, where it was looking at air pollution and life expectancy over time. So this is a crude example of work from the 1970s that evaluated changes in life expectancy that were associated with safe water programs in different cities in France. Um, and I think one can imagine studies where we observe space-time changes in child mortality in places where the LPG program in India was implemented, for example. 
Uh, a number of researchers have started to explore the use of imagery data from satellites or from uh, Google Street View for exposure assessment. Um, it may be possible, for example, to use images that identify local sources of, of pollution, including stoves. Um, so these are some examples from uh, Accra and from Dhaka. And you can see that we're able to pick up some of the stoves uh, that are used by households, at least outdoors in these images. Um, that being said, it becomes really hard to identify a source that's primarily done inside the home. So uh, in a study that we're, we're working on in Accra for object detection, out of the 1,200 images that we were using, there were only 18 discernible stoves. So this is, this is obviously a, a very small number for any kind of machine vision model. Uh, a number of studies have used large-scale implementation of small temperature sensors to measure, measure stove use. So the idea is that there's a small button-sized temperature sensor that's placed on the surface of stoves. Um, and the reason why this is done is because stove uptake and use has been um, historically a big problem or, or challenge in a lot of these intervention studies and trials. Um, so trying to understand how households are using their stoves um, is beneficial for thinking about implementation of, of policies. Um, so they collect long-term data on stove surface temperature, and then um, researchers have used machine learning techniques um, then to develop algorithms that can detect a rise in temperature that are associated with stove use events. So um, this is an example of work that was done by Ajay Polarasetti um, to identify stove use events for the HAPN trial. Uh, which is the large uh, multi-country LPG stove trial. Um, and then in that trial, they took it one step further. So um, they use this platform to identify intervention households that may not be compliant uh, in using their LPG stoves or maybe starting to use their traditional stove. So the study team gets a weekly email on compliance so that uh, flagged households um, that, that have been identified as potentially non-compliant can be visited by field staff um, who can then encourage compliance uh, in the trial. Uh, I know a number of other people are going to be talking about low-cost air pollution monitors, so I'm, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time on this, um, but I just want to note that these also have the potential for use in settings of household air pollution, uh, but again with the additional challenges like inconsistent or, or lack of electricity, the really high levels of humidity that we tend to see um, in a lot of developing country settings that we know are problematic for these sensors. Um, and I, I think it's well recognized that calibration against a reference monitor is important for a lot of the low cost sensors. And I think while many of us are fortunate to um, you know, be in universities where there's a, a reference PM 2.5 monitor um, at our university or even in our building, um, the majority of countries in sub-Saharan Africa don't have a, a, a single reference monitor available for use. Um, so just to, to briefly summarize, um, I think there's relatively widespread agreement that actions to reduce household air pollution are, are very well warranted. These exposures are, are very high and we have lots of evidence that um, air pollution is bad for health from lots of different studies in, in many different countries. Um, but I think how to best um, improve uh, uh, air quality in settings of household air pollution is, is still a big question. Um, I think there's some effort to move beyond the focus of a, of a single stove um, and even maybe beyond um, household level interventions. And I think the, the increase in national or regional energy programs provide an opportunity to, to assess these more complex and, and realistic interventions. Um, I think there's a big need to understand the distributional effects of these clean energy programs. We really know very little about how they impact the very poor in communities, um, you know, whether or not they are able to afford the cost of a clean stove or the additional costs of a clean stove or clean fuel. Um, and I think integration of social science research in conjunction with epidemiologic research is, is particularly helpful to, to try and address those questions. Um, and then I guess just reiterating Doug's point around big data, I think there's lots of exciting developments and uses for big data and household air pollution, a lot of which are already being leveraged. 
um, but these are going to require lots of collaboration across um, multiple sectors and disciplines um, and a really thoughtful study design. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Kiros Prohane. I'll have the privilege of uh, introducing the next two speakers. Uh, the third speaker is uh, Dr. Roger Peng from Johns Hopkins University, Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's a professor of biostatistics. Uh, he's a world-class expert on methods development in environmental biostatistics, with focus on spatiotemporal data. He has made huge contributions in leading important applications to environmental health research, with focus on health effects of air pollution and climate change. He's known for expertise in reproducibility research, very skilled in software development, and of course, uh, many of you may know him from his podcasts on data science. Today, he's going to talk about uh, opportunities for artificial intelligence and machine learning in environmental health. Roger. Thank you, Kiros. Uh, I just want to double check that my audio is okay here. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. All right. Okay, so um, I just want to thank the first two speakers for some excellent presentations. Um, and I just want to note that you know, there's been a lot of discussion of study design uh, in the last, in the first two presentations. Um, and so I'll be shifting a little bit, talk a little bit more about kind of analytical approaches and techniques that may be kind of uh, kind of new and exciting approaches that we could use in environmental health. Of course, with the caveat that and I think this has already been mentioned or at least implied that uh, you know, no amount of fancy uh, analytical techniques can substitute for you know, solid study design uh, and, and, and good uh, measurement. Uh, so with that in mind, I think I'll talk a little bit about kind of what artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques might mean for environmental health uh, going forward. So, um, so I think just to paint the very, very big picture, just for just to kind of make sure that everyone's on the same page and we have the same kind of context. Uh, the basic way that I see this issue is, you know, so we have a dramatic increase in computing power attributable to something like Moore's Law. Uh, and that has led to kind of two parallel developments. The first is what I would think of as big data, which is largely caused by kind of the, Im the improvement of measurement technology. And kind of in parallel to that, uh, is the increase in al what I call algorithmic sophistication, uh, which has led to a number of uh, t the kind of deployment of a number of different techniques that we might think of as artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, and of course, these, these two things interact with each other quite a bit. And the question that we want to I want to address today is really kind of how do those two things, plus the field of environmental health and air pollution in particular, uh, interact to create something new. And so. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of background to kind of these ideas and some examples of how these things might come together and work. So uh, on top of that, I wanted to mention that the National Academies uh, just a little under a year ago uh, had a two-day workshop on the implications of artificial intelligence and machine learning in, in, in environmental health, generally speaking, so not just in air pollution, but although there was a, quite a bit of discussion of that topic. Um, uh, and then particularly, they talked about various applications where AI and machine learning could have an impact such as pollution source characterization, exposure assessment was of course a big topic, uh, and predicting chemical toxicity. Um, there was also discussion of a number of challenges uh, such as data quality and uncertainty and transparency reproducibility that, uh, that I'll touch on a little bit today too. Uh, there, for, if you're interested in this workshop, there is a very nice summary uh, on the National Academy's uh, website there. Uh, some of the questions that were addressed in this two-day workshop, which, I'll think, which I think are relevant here, uh, are kind of in general, how might AI techniques advance in environmental health? Um, how does AI change the standards or the approaches that, we, that are used for conducting environmental health research? Um, and does, is, does, do they imply any change in our established kind of research principles? Um, some more ancillary questions are how do training programs change to adapt to kind of these kinds of techniques? Um, and whether there are any barriers to kind of academics who are working in this area um, in, their, in their institutions. Um, and so the, I was on the organizing committee for this uh, workshop and along with many others uh, around the community and then we had a joint statement that we wrote at the end of this workshop that you can find uh, at this last link here. Uh, my general uh, 
thrust of this presentation is that, um, you know, I think there's a lot that we can bring over from the artificial intelligence and machine learning world, which has, for the most part, developed in kind of the computer science kind of fields um, and has uh, had a huge kind of, um, shall I say, um, uh, explosion of activity uh, in really the commercial sector quite a bit. Um, and uh, I think so in that sense, there's a lot that we can, that can translate over into kind of environmental health research. Uh, but with the caveat that we need to adapt these approaches to the specific needs of uh, environmental health and air pollution research in particular, because the things that they do, for example, in the commercial world, in product development, are not the same things that we do when doing an air pollution study, when trying to assess the impact of changes in air pollution or changes in a policy uh, on health outcomes. And so we can, it's tempting to just kind of uh, copy and paste over to uh, air pollution research uh, a lot of these fancy techniques, uh, but I think some thought needs to be put into what are the needs of this of our particular field, and how can we adapt those approaches to meet those needs? And some and some issues that I think are worth thinking about right off the bat are uh, first our transparency and reproducibility of these approaches, um, and then another one is how do we evaluate the the how do we do model evaluation with these kinds of methodologies in the context that matters for things like air pollution studies or other environmental studies. Um, and lastly, how do we think about kind of building evidence for decision making in uh, in an air pollution context? Um, a lot of these techniques are in artificial intelligence and machine learning are really designed for settings uh, uh, that are kind of an autonomous uh, process. And so, what we think of autonomous systems, we often think of you know either self driving or self flying or whatever cars, things like that. But there's many many areas where we might think of a system as being autonomous where decisions are kind of made without any sort of human intervention or without frequent human intervention. Um, and, I, and I think the decision-making process in, at least in the air pollution context, um, is quite a bit different from that. Uh, it's not that we have machines making decisions about policies, but I think a lot of the uh, 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 output and, and uh, evidence generated by these kinds of approaches would, would, uh, would certainly uh, fit into a larger framework about what kinds of evidence could be used for decision making, and so these particular tools could be could generate some powerful evidence um, for decision making, but would not necessarily be the decision making tools themselves. Uh, I'll talk about the other two topics uh, also in a, a little bit later. Um, one of the things that I think uh, that uh, has been touted as an advantage of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques is the is kind of the ability to automate so you know kind of lower level modeling decisions. So. Anytime we have an analysis or a data set uh, and a question that we want to address, we often have to make, we often kind of try to a bunch of different approaches and kind of see what works um, and, uh, and see what kind of produces the best or kind of the most interpretable uh, results. And, uh, and, these, and machine learning techniques have an ability to kind of automate that approach to, so that we don't have to make quite as many low level decisions in the modeling process. And the idea to kind of being that we want to reserve kind of the uh, the, the higher level decisions for people or for humans uh, in, in the higher level, higher in the modeling process. Uh, but one of the issues that does come up is that the low level decisions that you make that these machine learning techniques make uh, can actually have a big impact on, on kind of downstream results. Uh, and so it's important to, even though we may not want to kind of fiddle around too much with these methods, it's important to know under, or to understand how these methods make these low level decisions in the data. Uh, and, 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 and the reality of these kinds of techniques is that they do require quite a bit of manual tuning. Uh, and so in, in some sense, the, the decisions that we traditionally made in data analysis kind of, kind of got pushed to other areas of the analytic kind of sequence, uh, but that doesn't mean that they've all been eliminated. Um, so that's kind of on the, uh, on the um, kind of some of the issues that we're going to talk about. I want to mention some of the measurement technologies that have uh, kind of uh, produce an explosion in big data, um, and uh, one big one, of course, is um, is wearables. Uh, and this has kind of both on the exposure side and also on the health side of the equation. Uh, things like accelerometers, sleep tracking, heart rate monitors. There, there's a whole slew of wearable technologies kind of coming out on a very regular basis that allow us to kind of track various aspects of people, uh, of their exposures. Uh, uh, and things like that. And one of the, I think the, if there's a common element that brings a lot of these technologies together, it is their high frequency nature of measurement. And so they tend to measure data at pretty short intervals and, or a very high frequency, um, and it, which results in a lot of data. Now, whether 
that amount of data is needed for a particular question um, you know, it is obviously, obviously depends on the question, uh, but they tend to measure at very high frequencies and generate large data sets. Uh, exposure monitoring obviously has changed a lot uh, too, has been an explosion of, of technology in that area too, with personal monitors, with low cost sensors. Um, there's also kind of crowdsourced monitoring with various commercial sensors. Um, and these also tend to um, measure at a high frequency basis. Uh, and so you get a lot of time points and a lot of values there. Uh, but of course, as, been, as Jill mentioned in the previous presentation, there are issues in terms of calibration, in terms of their lifetime, in terms of their reliability uh, of these kinds of monitors. Uh, in addition, we have, uh, in, we've had improvements in terms of GIS data, in remote sensing, satellite monitoring, uh, these kinds of technologies. We have a lot more um, ability to not only image wide areas of, say, the United States or the world, but on a, a synoptic basis. So we got daily measurements, or so sometimes twice daily measurements from things like satellites um, that are in a kind of a sun-synchronous orbit. So um, that's a lot of, a kind, of uh, kind of sensing data that can be integrated with things like low-cost sensors and whatnot. Um, and so the general theme with all these technologies, I think, is, is an increase in the temporal frequency with which we measure the data. And, and because and some of them are either low cost or because the remote sensing is so powerful, high resolution, we get a much higher spatial resolution too. So higher frequency and higher spatial resolution both lead to an explosion in, kind of the, the, in the size of the data sets and in the detail that we have. Um, I, I don't intend for this uh, presentation to be a review of machine learning techniques, as, as that would be quite a, a substantial haul, but I just wanted to kind of highlight some of the generic features of these approaches. Um, we tend to think of artificial intelligence and machine learning as, uh, as kind of specific types of models, like neural networks or random forests or these kinds of things, support vector machines. Even linear regression might qualify as a machine learning technique. Uh, but the reality is that these techniques uh, are coupled with a, a many other steps uh, that go into the ultimate outcome, which is a prediction. Uh, the first, of course, is the data processing and transformation and filtering. Uh, so what data points do we use? What gets included? Those kinds of decisions are made at a very low level, uh, and, but can have an impact on kind of predictive ability of these approaches. The second step is very important in all methods, is called, is, which is feature engineering or feature selection. And this, roughly speaking, comes down to selecting essentially what we might think of as predictors or the variables that go into the machine learning models. Um, and so, for example, uh, if you're looking at an image, like a, like a Google Street image or a satellite image, you might want to think of, well, which aspects of that image are I go, am I going to use to, as, um, for my prediction model? Uh, that kind of feature selection or feature engineering can be automated, but it has, often has a number of manual uh, elements to it. Um, that, that people, that humans kind of need to intervene on. Uh, after you've got the features and the data processing, there is a model building step where you have to build the model, you have to evaluate it, you have to split the data into testing and evaluation sets, uh, and training sets too. Um, and so that is part of the model building process. And then lastly, we, there is some out of sample prediction pr um, process where we kind of evaluate the performance of the fin final model on a metric, uh, performance metric of our choice. Uh, something along the lines of a mean squared error or a uh, area under the curve or R squared or things like that. So uh, that's the general kind of sequence. Of course, there are many different kinds of approaches that can fit under such a generic framework, uh, but that, those are some of the highlights. Um, one of the, uh, uh, some of the characteristics of machine learning approaches as opposed to more traditional analytic approaches uh, is that most machine learning approaches really thrive on having large feature sets. So lots of variables, lots of predictors, um, and, and they, they, they thrive on these because they tend to penalize uh, the, uh, the weight that each one of these features gets. So they're not, they're not thrown off by things like multicollinearity or uh, a high correlation between predictors like traditional methods such as, uh, sorry, as linear regression. Uh, might be. Uh, and so uh, that's one of the features of machine learning approaches. Um, there, these approaches tend to be uh, highly optimized um, to be fit to large data sets. So they're really designed uh, to be fit to extremely large data sets. And this comes out of the kind of the commercial nature of a lot of these approaches who, where many large companies are dealing with data sets that are coming in uh, on a very high frequency basis and they need to fit these models very quickly to kind of respond or to make a decision.
uh, in real time. And so as a result, uh, we have access to a huge number of highly engineered platforms and libraries uh, that can be used to fit these models. And, and, and for routine problems, they can be fit in very little, with you, rel relatively little work. Um, some of these libraries uh, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Keras, um, allow you to kind of fit basic models uh, with just a few kind of lines of code uh, that can be executed at very large scale and very large data sets. Um, and depending on the hardware that you have ac ac accessible to your, to your analysis, you could be running this on cluster, large clusters of computers, on graphical you know, processing units, things like that. So uh, these highly engineered platforms uh, reduce or, or almost eliminate the amount of kind of work that needs to be done to fit these complex approaches. Um, so, and so that's a huge advantage uh, and a huge kind of contribution to the field uh, that has been made mostly by uh, kind of industry and kind of commercial uh, participants. Um, and then, um, so, and the, so these machine learning approaches, the, one of the driving reasons to use them is that they, they leverage these large data sets to kind of uh, capture various nonlinearities and complex interactions in an automatic way that, um, that we may not be able to pre-specify in advance if we don't know that they exist. Um, and so in the event that we don't have particularly large data sets, it's often very difficult to observe such nonlinearities or complex interactions. And so therefore, on smaller data sets, these types of approaches tend not to offer a huge advantage uh, over more traditional analytic models. Okay. So I want to give one example uh, uh, in uh, of the use of these kinds of approaches uh, in exposure assessment, which I think is a, has is an area that has probably perhaps the most um, kind of potential for machine learning and artificial intelligence type techniques. Uh, this comes out of Scott Weichenthal's group, um, where and he has a number of papers along these lines where they where they use um, satellite images to kind of complement the tr traditional use of things like land use regression models and GIS type data. And here, they use convolutional neural networks to kind of analyze the satellite uh, images to determine levels of, of particulate matter um, air pollution. And I, one couple of things I want to highlight about this particular approach, um, uh, in, I think the use of satellite images is relevant because uh, it does seem to appear that the, that the convolutional networks or deep, uh, deep learning approaches um, are quite good at looking at, at image data. Um, Image data has the advantage of being highly structured, uh, it's highly regular, uh, and it can be decomposed uh, into different kind of scales of variation very easily. And so the images like satellite images or, or street view images can be broken down into different layers kind of in this convolutional neural network, and, and, and therefore a lot of kind of information can be extracted um, out of them. And so uh, they use land use regression models to kind of predict levels or average levels of ambient PM. Uh, so we're not thinking over time at this moment. Uh, and then they complement that with satellite images uh, and apply to kind of with uh, convolutional neural networks applied to them in order to kind of expand the coverage of these land use regression models uh, that don't have any GIS data available. And so their basic approach is to obtain the satellite images from Google Maps, uh, which has satellite data. And, uh, and then they train their convolutional neural network to the output from the land use regression. So it's worth bearing in mind that the, the, the land use regression output is considered to be kind of like the outcome or is the truth, so to speak. Um, and then they apply this neural network model to a larger region to get kind of a broader coverage. And so there is a bit of a trade-off that goes on here, which is that we can increase the coverage of our exposure assessment uh, with the penalty of a little bit of decreased precision because uh, the model is actually trained to the output of another model. So this is just one assessment that they present uh, uh, comparing uh, the land use regression model, so this is kind of the traditional approach, with the output from the convolutional neural network. Uh, and on the left, you can see that two cities, one in Montreal, one in Toronto. And you can see the, uh, the kind of co coherence or the kind of um, correspondence between the two approaches, the x-axis being the neural network and the y-axis being the uh, land use regression or the traditional approach. So, um, so this is in this this assessment was done in an area where both obviously where both techniques uh, could be applied. Um, so, I just I want to I, I bookmark this for a, a couple slides later where I talk about how do we evaluate what the the way that models perform uh, and how they do things in the kind of traditional traditionally in the AI and ML world and how we might want to uh, 
adapt that for uh, air pollution research. And so this is a useful picture because it shows us kind of where or at what levels uh, the models do or do not correspond. Um, but they, if I'm, my, my general sense is that this, is, this could potentially hide some performance issues with uh, these kinds of models because of the lack of any kind of spatial detail. So um, moving on from this though, you can see this on the upper left, uh, the orange region uh, is the coverage for the land use regression model where there's GIS data available. And then the kind of red outlined regions is where um, the satellite data uh, can, are able to cover. And so the point of this, of course, being that we want to expand uh, the coverage of our exposure assessment. And so we can use the satellite data to kind of predict in areas where we have uh, no GIS data. Uh, so that's on the left and on the right, uh, we have um, the predicted values from the convolutional neural network model uh, based on the satellite data. And on the top, I believe is Montreal, yes. And then on the bottom is uh, Toronto. So, uh, so this is kind of the, the ultimate output for, from these kinds of models, which combines the GIS with the uh, satellite coverage. Okay, so I, I mentioned a second ago in terms of model evaluation. And one of the things that I think needs to be thought about a little bit more carefully in this area is that air pollution and generally environmental health data is technically, is, tends to be measured over space and time. And I think that's a, a poor, although an obvious maybe kind of statement to make, it's relevant and, 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 and I think shouldn't be ignored uh, when applying artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to this area. Uh, in many other contexts where AI and ML are used, there isn't necessarily a space-time uh, kind of aspect. So for example, if you're measuring clicks on a website and you wanna know whether this design is better than this other design, that's not quite exactly the same. There may be a temporal element there, but they, it may be ignored. Um, uh, and, and similarly, there's other um, contexts where machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques are used where we may not worry too much about the space or the time kind of nature of the data. Uh, but in air pollution uh, studies, we, we do, uh, studies tend to de either compare over space or they tend to compare over time. So if we're going to have an exposure assessment approach that is based on a machine learning model, we wanna be able to, the, the bottom line I would say is that we wanna evaluate the quality of that model based on the spatial and temporal needs of our air pollution studies. Uh, so for example, if I might crudely dichotomize uh, the health effects that we tend to think of as either short-term or long-term, or perhaps a uh, short distance, I don't know, if the, a short distance or long distance, um, then we want to make sure that the prediction models that we generate uh, can accurately uh, reconstruct the short and long time scales as well as the short and large kind of spatial scales. Um, and so Typically, we don't want we don't focus on all of these spatial or temporal scales all at once. We either look at say acute effects for short term or chronic effects for long term, and so um, and so that's I think an important thing to recognize. We typically use global evaluation metrics uh, in a, in with a, artificial intelligence and machine learning models, things like uh, like a cross validated R squared or a root mean squared error or uh, area under the curve. These are global metrics that kind of provide an overall evaluation of a model, uh, but they don't necessarily give an, a lot of detail into how the model is replicating specific spatial or temporal scales. Um, and so these global metrics that might, it, it have the potential to hide uh, kind of uh, uh, poor predictions or errors that, ex that only exist at specific temporal or spatial scales. And if we focus our analyses on those scales, then our model may seem better than it actually is. Um, and I want to highlight one piece of work that was done by, uh, uh, by Brent Cool and a number of his colleagues, um, which is looking at the spatial scales of variation of particulate matter in the kind of Boston area. Um, and they use wavelets to decompose uh, the, the, the um, air pollution exposure, concentration levels in this area. Uh, and they kind of dichotomize uh, the exposures into kind of a low frequency um, or low or large scale spatial structure um, with a high frequency or high kind of short term or small scale spatial structure. Um, so that's so left is the low frequency, middle is high, and then the and the right is just the kind of global prediction that is made by the model. And so if we looked at um, just the right hand side, that's the output, that's the raw output from the model. Uh, we don't necessarily know whether we, uh, immediately what kind of whether the various uh, kind of spatial uh, 
uh, elements are being reconstructed properly at the different frequencies. So being able to decompose that um, into the left-hand side in the middle is useful to see, okay, whether the large scale and the, and the small scale structure is being replicated um, properly. Um, and so, and the reason why that's important is because the effects are different at these scales. So this is their, uh, so their result where they're looking at um, a birth weight at, in the various trimesters. So I'll just focus on the first trimester just to save time. And you can see that the, um, the, there's, they have different effects. The square on the very left is the kind of total PM effect. So just when you, when you compare PM to birth weight. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you see that how you, what happens when you decompose uh, the pollution into the different scales. Uh, and so the large scale has a, a much bigger negative effect than the fine scale, um, which has a smaller but still negative effect. Um, and so the different, the point here being that the different uh, spatial scales have very different associations with the outcome that you're looking at, which is in this case birth weight. Um, and so if you're focused on that particular uh, scale, whether it's low or high, you want to make sure that a given model, a prediction model, can reproduce or, or can, can predict well the variation of the exposure in that um, kind of low or high range, sort of low or high frequency range, I should say. Okay. So uh, next thing I wanted to so the I just mentioned model evaluation. The next issue is transparency and reproducibility. Uh, and this is an, again, I think arises from the kind of the, um, the applications that have kind of driven a lot of the commercial applications of AI and ML techniques. Um, which is that these techniques are quite complex they, and, um, and they involve a lot of parameters and, and part of that is because they involve a lot of data. Um, and I think the analogy that I like to, that I like to use here is comes from my colleague, John Buscelli. He says, you know, would you, how would you evaluate a paper that ran logistic regression, which is a classical technique, uh, but didn't publish any of the coefficients or the weights, right? So, and this is ironic because I think most of the time when, in air pollution studies, when we, if we do a logistic regression, the thing that we're actually interested in is the coefficients or the weights. Uh, so not publishing that would be like not publishing the results. Uh, but in many contexts where uh, AI and ML methods are used, we don't care about the, the numeric values of these coefficients or these weights uh, in these uh, um, learning methods. We care about the predictive quality of the outcome and whether it's able to predict well um, uh, on, on, in general, uh, on an out-of-sample basis. So the, this, whether a given coefficient is 4.6 or a 7.8 isn't really relevant uh, in a lot of contexts, especially in the kind of commercial world. Uh, but that, and even in, in an air pollution study or in an environmental health context, uh, even if the weights themselves are not particularly relevant or interpretable, uh, there would still be a need to produce them or to disclose them for the sake of reproducibility. Um, and for the sake of kind of learning how these models work and how they can be kind of used in the future. Um, and part of the issues is that e even very minor variations in these kind of uh, standardized machine learning platforms uh, like TensorFlow or whatnot uh, can be difficult to reproduce if you don't have the exact details. Um, and so I think, so there is a need to kind of figure out, well, what are the things, how do we, re how do we communicate these uh, model parameters because they're so numerous and so and they're so kind of co complicated. How do we communicate them in a way that others can kind of understand what is going on, uh, but are not too much of a burden for the people br uh, producing the models? Um, and one thing I, I just want to highlight here is that the reproducibility of the techniques or the models um, is not about you know ensuring that something is good or not. It's not a badge of quality. It's really about ha having it so that we can understand what is going on in the model, and if we wanted to apply this model um, in another context, we would know kind of how it was working here. Um, and so I think in many sense, you know, if you're doing product development, uh, then the, the, what, the, uh, what the customer cares about is that it works, uh, but that's not really science. Uh, and so in the, if from this, in the scientific context, we have to know how it works um, and not that it works. And so that is the kind of one thing that I think that needs to be adapted among other ideas in terms of um, the reproducibility and the transparency of these types of modeling approaches. Um, so one quick example uh, comes from, uh, was a paper in Nature uh, where a couple of researchers at Google produced an artificial intelligence system for breast cancer screening. Uh, and uh, in the paper itself, it says, you know, the code used for training the model has a large number of dependencies on internal tooling. So internal to Google, that is. Um, infrastructure structure and hardware and its release is therefore not feasible. So the idea being here that there's a lot of what they've done 
uh, was based on kind of code and libraries and perhaps hardware that are at Google and they cannot be released for proprietary reasons um, and, and for tr uh, proprietary or trade secret type of reasons. And so, and I think, so a number of scientists in the genomics kind of area um, uh, responded saying that this is really not acceptable, uh, even with a kind of plain language or description uh, you can't reproduce these computational pipelines based on just like a textual description. And it's basically impossible to reproduce any of these results, no matter how good they might seem. Um, and so these details include things like the how I mentioned before in terms of how the data are transformed, how the features are engineered, uh, what are the hyperparameters for defining the model structure, any sort of stochastic. So a lot of the elements of model fitting, fitting can be stochastic. And so if you run it twice, you don't get exactly the same thing. So how do these stochastic transformations work and how can we reproduce them? Um, details about the fitting algorithms. So a lot of these uh, gradient descent or stochastic data gradient descent algorithms have a lot of details, a lot of tuning parameters that you can change to make them work better. Um, so as you can see, this is just a, little, a hint or a smattering of all the little details that need to be um, uh, kind of revealed in order to actually reproduce what someone's done. And on top of that, all of that, uh, this particular paper had some proprietary data sets that could not be released. So, and that's just a, a separate, the, the data sharing issues I think are a separate thing from the kind of uh, analytic issues. So lastly, Sorry I just want to- Sorry to interrupt, uh, we need to be wrapping up. Can you jump to your conclusions, please? Sure, no problem. Yeah, so um, I will just summarize. So I think I, 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 my point is that a lot of these machine learning approaches are quite uh, useful and have, a, and I think could be relevant in environmental health and air pollution studies, but we need to adapt them to the specific issues that are raised in our work, in particular things like transparency and reproducibility for the modeling um, and how to kind of uh, fit these approaches into the existing decision-making frameworks in air pollution or in environmental health settings. So thank you. Thank you very much, Roger, for that very insightful and interesting uh, presentation. By the way, I forgot to mention that Roger is actually a member of the HEI review committee as well. So last but not least, um, our speaker is going to be Dr. Neil Pierce from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And his talk is going to be entitled, The Big Deal About Big Data, Causal Inference, and Accountability Research, What's Next? Uh, Dr. Pierce is professor in epidemiology and biostatistics, as well as professor of non-communicable disease IP, epidemiology at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Health. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of New, New Zealand and the UK Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, he's well known for his research on uh, environmental um, you know, science. His current research interests focus on epidemiological and biostatistical methods, and especially in their applications to studies of occupational and environmental health, including outcomes such as asthma, kidney disease, and neurological disease. Uh, Dr. Pierce? Sure, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, and um, if I put the slideshow up, do you just see one slide or do you see more than one? Uh, more than one right now. Okay, so I've got a slight problem with my screen, so I'll just have to show the slides like this. I'll increase the size a little bit. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I think we're running out of time, so I've, I've just cut a cup, couple of my slides, but um, the main things I want to say are quite simple. The, um, it's, what I'm gonna talk about is a bit different than the other speakers, but it's very consistent with them. Um, but I want to step back and look at the big picture of um, evaluating observational studies and uh, evidence synthesis. And the main thing I want to say should be non-controversial, non which is that um, when we evaluate a particular um, association, like does, um, you know, does a pesticide cause a particular type of cancer, we need to consider all of the evidence and that evidence synthesis always involves evaluating all of the evidence rather than the alternative approach, which is to try and do one good study and, and focus on the findings of that study. So this is my rough schema of evidence synthesis. Um, this is following um, what IARC does, where the International Agency for Research on Cancer, where it considers observational and uh, con randomized controlled trials in humans. It considers animal data and mechanistic data. And the human data may include systematic reviews, meta-analysis, triangulation, I'll talk about in a moment, and other types of evidence. 
and at the at the bottom we have the individual studies. So the um, the main point I want to get across is that evidence synthesis involves everything in this slide, and that we have to consider all of the evidence um, that relates to any of the boxes in this slide. Um, these are Bradford Hill's viewpoints. Um, I won't go through them all, but I will read this quote. He says, what I do not believe, and this has been suggested, is that we can usefully lay down some hard and fast rules of evidence that must be obeyed before we can accept cause and effect. None of my nine viewpoints can bring indisputable evidence for or against cause and effect, and none can be required. What they can do with greater or less strength is to help us to make up our minds on the fundamental question, is there any other way of explaining the set of facts before us? Is there any other answer equally or more likely than cause and effect? So Bradford Hill's viewpoints were, were viewpoints. He, he made it very clear there were no rules for deciding whether um, a particular association was causal. Bradford Hill's paper was published in 1965. I still think there's nothing better. It's still the best foundation for assessing evidence. Um, there have been a few developments since then, and I'll particularly give some examples of the idea of ruling out alternatives and the idea of triangulation. Both of them are consistent with Bradford Hill, but they really just take some of his um, viewpoints and develop them a bit further. So here's three quick examples that are, that are relevant to these. Um, first one is um, ruling out alternatives. When, when smoking and lung cancer was, well, was first discovered in 1931, but the, the first good evidence came along in the 1950s, and it was argued that um, the evidence might not be causal because there, were, there might be genes that caused people to smoke and also caused them to get lung cancer. And this idea that was put forward by Fisher, one of the leading statisticians in the, in the century, um, people argued about it for 30 or 40 years. And it turns out he was, he was partly correct, but only partly, you know, not enough to explain the association. But the, the whole idea was refuted the, the moment it came out, because if there were genes that caused smoking and cause lung cancer, then lung cancer would always have been high in the population. But instead, what we see is lung cancer increasing as smoking increased. The, the point of this example was that um, time trends in ecologic studies are normally ranked very low in terms of um, causal inference. But this is an example, and there are many others, where they actually can play a crucial role. So if we had any sort of scoring um, system for epidemi epidemiologic evidence, we would probably throw away evidence on time trends, but actually it can be very important. This um, second example is actually from my PhD, which I did in the 1980s. I did a case control study of non hodgkins lymphoma and pesticide exposure. And I had two, two control groups. One was a general population group, and one was a group of patients with other cancers. The argument for the general population group is that it represents the source population, but the concern was that if you compare people with um, cancer, non hodgkins lymphoma, and you compare them to the general population, then um, people with cancer may have thought about their exposures more, and you may see a difference between the cases and controls just because of information bias. On the other hand, other cancers shouldn't have the same problem. They've gone through the same thought process. But on the other hand, you will get a bias if um, some of these other cancers are also caused by the pesticides that you're studying. Now, the point of these two control groups is that, that they are both biased, but they will produce biases in opposite directions. And in my particular study, um, you can see here, for example, this is 1.3 odds ratio using other cancer controls and 1.3 using general population controls. And um, incidentally, I can hear some background noise coming, um, someone talking in the background. So if it's possible to mute that, that would be good. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, these two control groups are, are both biased. So if you went through any sort of scoring system, you would say they were both wrong, but they are biased in opposite directions. So the fact that you get the same answers with both control groups is actually very reassuring. Um, final answer would be um, confounding by smoking in occupational studies. 
Um, it's always raised in, uh, as a potential confounder in lung cancer studies, but um, typically it's, it's very small. You can see um, these are um, studies, either case control or cohort, which are either unadjusted or adjusted for smoking, and, and usually it makes no difference. What often happens when evaluating occupational studies is that the cohort studies don't have smoking data and they get rejected for that reason. The case control studies do get smoking data, but they're rejected because they are case control studies and there is this myth that case control studies are inherently um, less valid and, and therefore both types of evidence get thrown away. Whereas if you put together the evidence from cohort studies and from case control studies with smoking data, uh, it's very consistent. So that brings me to the topic of algorithms and um, the false hierarchy of study designs. And there is still this attitude that randomized controlled trials are always gonna be better than cohort studies and they in turn are always gonna be better than case control studies and, and so on down the chain. Um, most of you won't recognize this, um, the picture at the bottom of this slide, but it's from English football where um, the team I support, Chelsea, which is right at the top, was beaten by a team that is, was a long way below them in, in the various divisions. And the point is that on any given day, um, a, a very low ranked team can actually beat a, a really top team. And also for a particular issue, sometimes a cohort study or a case control study will be better than a randomized controlled trial and trying to draw general conclusions that one study design is better than the other is, is just not scientific. Um, here's an example from um, cardiovascular disease. Um, we all know that if you want to prevent cardiovascular disease, you should smoke less, you should exercise more, um, eat less salt, um, you should drink less and so on. Um, these are all very well established, but this is the evidence from population-based intervention studies. And this is a Cochrane review. So it's the biggest and best evidence available. These are all studies where they had an intervention group for lifestyle and a comparison group with no intervention. If the inter intervention was successful, you would expect the effect estimate, this blue point, to be to the left of the line. This is what you get when you put all of the evidence together. And these are the biggest and best studies that show that um, Thing, things like um, cholesterol and smoking and so on are, are um, how they relate to heart disease. And basically, the intervention studies show no benefit, even though we know from hundreds of observational studies that these things are beneficial. And the ra main reason that the intervention studies show no benefit is that, um, it, well, many reasons, but the most common reason is there's not much difference between the two groups, that the intervention group, many of them don't follow the intervention, and the control group, many of them do. So you just can't get a very, um, very good contrast. Um, a relevant paper with regards to air pollution. This is by Jennifer Peel, who's one of the um, one of the chairs of this session. She asks, "Are randomised trials necessary to advance epidemiologic research on household air pollution?" And she raises some many of the same issues. Um, that policymakers and funding agencies often call for more randomized trials, um, but they're not feasible for certain endpoints. They may not provide the necessary information and they may even lead to improper causal inference. Um, and here are some of the problems. They're not good for long latency or rare diseases. Um, you can use biomarkers for early effects, but the relevance is usually unclear. Very difficult to blind participants or investigators. Um, these are the two problems I just mentioned, low adoption of intervention and spillover effects. There are ethical considerations. There are many problems with RCTs uh, for air pollution. So what we really need, as um, Jennifer recommends, is a variety of study designs, both observational and randomized, and, and including a, a variety of research approaches. Um, so what we're dealing with here is really a very old debate. I've, I've been doing epidemiology for 40 years now, and the whole time there's always been this message that you can only prove causality for randomized controlled trials. It's not true. We have proved that smoking causes lung cancer before, beyond reasonable doubt. We've proved that asbestos causes lung cancer. We've discovered many things and established causality. 
without doing randomized controlled trials for any of them because to do randomized controlled trials would be impractical or unethical. The debate's now in a new form, namely that we can only establish causality with randomized controlled trials or observational studies which are analyzed using modern causal inference methods so that they look very much like randomized controlled trials. Um, and this is the basis for the, these algorithms, which unfortunately are becoming very influential. There's GRADE, um, which is, um, was originally developed for um, randomized trials, but is now being applied to observational studies. There's ROBINS, which is a tool for assessing risk of bias in non-randomized studies of interventions. Um, these would be the main two, but there's many more. I sit on many uh, advisory and regulatory committees, and there is constant pressure to use these particular algorithms to decide on the evidence. Why is it a problem? Um, basically, it's a rerun of the old debate that you can only establish causality with randomized controlled trials. It suggests that causality can be established with a single perfect study and we should always strive to do such a study rather than taking a more comprehensive triangulation approach. Um, Couple of recent examples. One um, many of you will be aware of is the controversy over red meat. Now, I'm not a great fan of nutritional epidemiology. I um, I think they it's difficult to do, and and it often gets findings that are wrong or, or modified over time. Nevertheless, this controversy is a good example of the misuse of algorithms which see the randomised controlled trial as the gold standard. This was a review, uh, IARC reviewed all the evidence for red meat. There were um, some randomized controlled trials, but not very good ones. Um, they, um, they were not interventions specifically on red meat. They didn't follow people for very long. Um, there was a lot of observational studies. There was, uh, there was good evidence from animals, and I put it all together and came to a conclusion about the carcinogenicity of red meat. What this review did was basically use GRADE and um, scored the observational studies and decided that none of them were any good and threw them all out and, and simply used a couple of intervention studies which were not really relevant and used that to decide that there was no firm evidence that red meat caused a health risk. And unfortunately, this approach is becoming more common. This is a quote from the New England Journal of Medicine um, just a few months ago. Rather than relying on the weight of evidence approach that EPA has traditionally used to infer causation, the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee wants to rely on studies that use manipulative causality. This theory restricts epidemiologic evidence that may be considered acceptable um, to assess causality to results from intervention studies or studies that have been analyzed with the use of causal inference statistical methods. And unfortunately, I think we have a sort of perfect storm now. Um, there's various vested interests, and that can include industry, it can include environmental groups, there's lots of pressure on regulatory agencies, and there's a natural tendency to want to have a good paper trail and to show how decisions were made, and um, therefore there's pressure to adopt a tick box approach. Um, and from causal inference theory, there's a similar pressure that only RCTs or RCT type observational studies can be used to establish causation. And that, this is creating major problems because if you follow that paradigm, we end up throwing a lot of good, good evidence away and, um, and therefore we can come to wrong decisions. So what should we do? Um, two very good papers I'll refer you to. Um, one is on the whole idea of triangulation um, done by Deborah Lawler and, and other people in Bristol. Triangulation is the practice of obtaining more reliable answers to research questions through integrating results from several different approaches, where each approach has different key sources of potential bias that are unrelated to each other. We emphasize the importance of being explicit about the expected direction of bias with each approach whenever this is possible, and seeking to identify approaches that would be expected to bias the true causal effect in different directions. And the second paper by um, David Savitz, who of course is heavily involved with HEI, um, he basically um, makes the same criticisms I do uh, about um, the problems with mechanistic risk of bias assessments. Um, and he, he argues that instead, risk of bias assessments should focus on identifying a small number of the most likely influential sources of bias, 
classifying each specific study based on how effectively it has addressed each potential bias and determining whether results differ across studies in relation to susceptibility to each hypothesized source of bias. So I think um, what's happening now in a lot of regulatory or th and policy committees is that you start with all the individual studies and you score them using something like Grade or Robbins and most of them get thrown away. And then only the studies that score well are actually assessed in terms of um, uh, causal inference. And as in the red meat example, you, you're not left with very much. So you end up throwing away a lot of good evidence, which may not be perfect on itself, but may address one particular issue and, and may contribute to triangulation. What we need to do, consistent with uh, David Savitz's paper, is turn this around. Start by looking at all of the evidence and then say, what are the potential biases? So for example, if, um, if you're looking at uh, uh, air pollution and lung cancer or occupational exposures and lung cancer, um, you might be concerned about confounding by smoking. And then you look at subgroups of studies, some of which have very good smoking data, some of which have not such good smoking data, and some of which have no smoking data. And the ones that have smoking data, did adjusting for smoking make a difference? If, the find, if it didn't, and if the findings are the same as in the studies which don't have smoking data, then you can be much more confident about the findings. Um, like I said, um, other evidence, including um, evidence on time trends and population patterns may be important. Um, you can look at different populations where the biases would be different or, or in different directions. You can look at animal studies, you can look at mechanisms. You need to consider all of the evidence. And I think we're, we're sort of stumbling into a situation where many policy committees, all they do is use these checklists like Grade and Robbins, they throw away most of the evidence and what they're left with is not very convincing. So they conclude that there's no evidence of causality. Um, doesn't mean that all the evidence is the same. Some is much better than others, but you have to look at it in context and, and consider it all together. So um, I've rushed through, through that a little bit because I wanted to make sure we have um, time for, for questions and discussion. But that's my main message that um, Causal inference and evidence synthesis is not just a particular set of techniques. And it's unfortunate that the name causal inference has really been captured by a particular approach to data analysis. Causal inference involves looking at all of the evidence. And sometimes you will have very good RCT evidence, often you won't. And um, whether you do or you don't, you need to consider also the evidence from animal studies, from mechanistic studies, and adopt a triangulation approach to looking at the evidence from observational studies. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neil, for that excellent and thought-provoking you know, presentation. At this point, I would also like to thank all our four distinguished speakers. I'm sure you join me in, uh, you know, you know, in saying that you know, those were really excellent and thought-provoking presentation as a whole. Uh, at this point, uh, what we're going to do is go to the question and answer session. And the panelists have agreed to be available a little bit, a few more minutes, so we might have a little bit more time. Thanks to all of you who submitted questions. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, kick off, you know, the session with two questions. I'm going to pose the first one, and uh, my co-chair Jennifer Peel is going to pose the other one. And I'm going to try to fold in some of the audience questions uh, into uh, what I'm going to put out uh, to the speakers. So the first question is. Um, given that all the potential of big data and uh, uh, machine learning techniques, what are the pitfalls that we need to guard against when using uh, AI or ML approach in accountability research and causal inference, especially in the big data context? And I would like you to frame your answers to, you know, in relation to relative value of bias versus inference, role of designs, and some of you have touched on already, increase in volume of data versus relative increase in signal versus noise, uh, especially because environmental health signals are generally small. Um, and a couple, three questions from the audience actually fit into this. One was by Svera Vedal, uh, especially focusing on this issue of propensity score matching in the big data context, and uh, whether you know, um, the lack of individual level matching 
actually could harm or how it can be handled, and also the overall quality of data um, in the big data setting. Then there was another question by A. Yong Jiang, uh, again dealing with issue of using big data that are dirty or messy and data that are not ready. And a related one was uh, from Kuaku Popio Asante uh, on the potential of AI and ML data, especially in the context of LMIC in Africa uh, in relation to quality of data and um, you know, um, availability of data. So maybe we can kick off with Roger since uh, he gave the technical presentation, but any of the speakers could chime in. Sure, yeah, I, uh, I'll try to address that massive question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about um, that. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think the, po the, the question itself kind of presumes that we can answer it. And I think one of the th things that I think is interesting about AI and ML in this area is that it's still, I think, relatively early on. And I think um, the biggest pitfall that we want to avoid is introducing any sort of false dichotomy between say analytical approaches and things like study design and, and measurement, uh, exposure measurement quality. Um, you know, we can't look at that as a trade-off uh, because and we have to think we have to continue to kind of have strong study design, strong um, questions and strong measurement um, in addition to the, using these kinds of approaches. Uh, so that's number one. And I think the other thing I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, there's a lot of these techniques have been very successful in kind of uh, what I would think of as somewhat specific settings and, and very kind of highly like kind of engineering types of settings. Um, and when, when they have been broadened out to more uh, kind of real world or say perhaps uh, different types of settings, especially in scientific contexts, um, they haven't necessarily been demonstrated to show dramatic benefits over say more traditional approaches. And I think, um, so that's something I think we need to kind of be careful not to just assume that these will be better or that they will be, uh, provide better or more information um, than other approaches. So, could, could I um, chip in, uh, Neil Pierce here? Um, big data is good for prediction. It's not good for causal inference. Um, it's it's very good for your supermarket to know you know what you would like to buy next week and send you some advertisements or some coupons. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to use for causal inference unless you have biological knowledge. Um, to give one example, if I have a big data set on lifestyle, I might find that if someone is a smoker, that predicts their lung cancer risk. I also might find if they use a cigarette lighter every day, that also predicts their lung cancer risk very well. Um, one of those is causal, one is just associational, but any big data analysis will probably pick out both of them as being important. And that's fine for prediction, but suppose I want to intervene and I ban cigarette lighters, it's, it's not going to work because it's not a causal association. And that is something you can't tell from the data. You need biological knowledge to know that smoking is a causal risk factor and using a cigarette lighter is not. So it, there are some uses in causal inference, but they're, they're very limited. It's, it's, it's mostly good for prediction. And, and that's why I think it's good for one of the examples Roger showed that you can use it to estimate people's exposure um, because it, it really doesn't matter if the predictors of exposure are causal or not. Thank you. Anything more to add, Doug or Jill? Um, no, I think the, the first two responses are great. Um, I guess the only thing that I'd add in, in sort of the, the low income uh, setting perspective, which is that I think it's quite tempting, um, or it's been quite tempting in, in sort of big data and data science to say, hey, there's lots of places where we don't have measurements. You know, this is going to be great. This is, this is going to solve all, all of our problems. And in a lot of cases, I think it's just not clear what we're measuring. Um, and it becomes really hard to test that in, in a very detailed and robust way. And so that certainly presents a, a challenge is if we're going to try and develop um, these data sources for low and middle income countries, there needs to be lots and lots of upfront work um, done in advance in, in trying to use these, and in, in particularly if you're using them in, in epidemiological studies or policy evaluations. Thank you. All right, uh, Doug, yes. anything to add? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes, on the, this issue of uh, the propensity scores, and um, you know, I think it's an interesting perspective to, to think about how we can use the big data to actually be matching people for interventions versus non-interventions. And I'm not sure propensity scores are the best uh, method here, but it certainly points us in a direction that we, you know, we can think of new ways to, to use these data and to be 
actually drilling down to get uh, better matching. And, you know, I, I think there's great potential here. But maybe if I could respond to that, because I really liked Doug's talk, except for the, this bit about matching, because um, it's a nice idea, but I, I, I don't think it's as useful as, as um, some people think. If you have a very large data set um, and you adjust for age, um, sex, and race, and then you create a, a subset where you actually um, match exposed and non-exposed by age, sex, and race, you will get exactly the same answer. Um, in fact, the large, larger data set will be a bit better because it has more people in it. So it's a nice conceptual thing because it's, it's once again, it's based on this RCT paradigm that you're setting it up as if you're doing an RCT, but whether you match on three or four variables or adjust for them, you'll get the same answer and you'll have the same problems of residual confounding as, as, it, as the full observational study. So I think it's a nice idea, but I don't think it's a solution. Uh, Neil, I think you're right about that. Yeah. that uh, it really is just an alternative uh, way of approaching this and actually consistent with your perspective of you know, using alternative approaches, yeah. looking for the consistency. I think this is a, another uh, opportunity to take advantage of that yeah. concept. I, yeah. I, I agree. Uh, no, I, I think it's a nice idea. Um, Thank you all for those uh, interesting answers. Uh, so Jennifer, if you could go on with the next question. Okay, so we had some interest in, in exploring this idea about uh, taking advantage of the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll address this first to Doug and then others can join in as well. So what are opportunities for accountability research um, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially with respect to big data and the decline in pollution and new health related complexities? Um, and also, are there potential confounding factors in this question that would be a barrier for the research? So, yeah, I, as you know, we're thinking about this, I mean, obviously, reading the newspapers, you see that we have a unique situation here where air pollution, traffic, uh, many things have changed. And to be creative and think about what the opportunities are, um, you know, We'll have to see how this develops, but clearly there are huge confounders, other things going on that are going to have to be need need to be considered. But gosh, to, to think about this as an opportunity, and uh, I mean, we never should be held back by the fact that you can't. Somebody saying you can't do this because you haven't thought about all the factors. I mean, there clearly are some really interesting things out there that. Uh, in the future, when we start gathering the data, would be potentially interesting. I mean, we've never, we've uh, answered around this question of what is the impact of living near a heavily trafficked road, for example. And uh, now we have the opportunity of looking at uh, what's happened if you remove all the traffic over a period of time, how does that affect the people living nearby? There's I think some really interesting uh, opportunities here for creative uh, young scientists to, to look at. I, I'm just very excited about, well, I'm not excited about the coronavirus, but I'm excited about what this presents as an opportunity. Absolutely. Any of the other panelists want to chime in here? Yeah, sure. Um... Two things, I agree completely with Doug. It's a, it's a huge opportunity, particularly to look at air pollution, and he would know a lot better than me what could be done, but there is great potential there. Secondly, whatever's done is, is not <laughs> gonna look like the study designs we are taught in Epidemiology 101, and it's not gonna look like an RCT. And I think the whole issue of, of COVID Show, shows it's really a condensed version of what happens with any sort of evidence synthesis. You know, if you're looking at air pollution or pesticides or something, you might spend 20 or 30 years, but ultimately you still have to make decisions on the basis of imperfect evidence, and you normally don't have RCTs. Here it's happening with COVID, but it's happening in a few weeks, so people have to make decisions about whether to lock down New York or not. Um, but you can't do an RCT. You can't lock down New York and not lock down Chicago. But, but you do have natural experiments and you have 
all sorts of evidence. And, and that it's like a condensed version that of what happens in any evidence synthesis that ultimately you have to make decisions based on a whole variety of ev evidence, none of which is perfect. I have to agree with Neil very strongly here that uh, this is not going to be the same type of studies we've done in the past. And it's really interesting that uh, the people the, in the administration who've uh, rejected science before uh, because, well, for many of the reasons Neil had uh, elucidated in his, his talk uh, requiring RCTs, for example, now are basing you know, decisions based on anecdotal evidence. I mean, it's really an extraordinary situation for how decisions are actually made in, uh, in a, a volatile uh, situation without much real scientific evidence. Um, just, just from a household air pollution standpoint, um, one thing that I did want to mention is I think while we're seeing these reductions in lots of places um, due to changes and reductions in traffic and, and in China industrial emissions, um, I, I think it's possible that in, in a lot of places where, where household air pollution is an issue, we could actually see higher exposures. Um, so people are inside more. Um, we know that people, at least anecdotally, are cooking more. Um, they're using their stove more. They're seeking sort of comforts that might be associated with warmer temperatures inside of the home, um, which would be associated with increases in, in uses of fireplaces and, um, and other types of heating stoves. So I think that, you know, certainly lots of people have, uh, including the ongoing trial that's happening right now, there's lots of places that are measuring long-term indoor concentrations and exposures in these settings, and it'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out. Um, and it, it might be quite different from urban areas. Okay, thanks. So there is actually a follow-up question that goes with the first one I asked from Chad Bailey, uh, probably with Roger uh, as a first responder. Uh, how much has been done to evaluate the use of AI and uh, machine learning methods to make noisy measurements more precise? And what are the metrics for evaluating such efforts? Uh, if you could answer to that one. And I think the question was in the context of uh, complex ML models with many low-cost air pollution sensors, uh, as an example. I think this is, um, I mean, with the caveat that I, you know, uh, this is just my <laughs> personal exposure to this area, but I think uh, I, there is a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of developing algorithms and approaches to um, calibrating these types of things, especially in kind of a real-time setting, um, uh, because um, I think it's it's not immediately clear, you know, given this, if you have multiple monitors, let's say like a single reference monitor, or if you have multiple reference monitors, how you kind of calibrate them and how you adjust them in real time, because these mon the low cost sensors tend to drift and they tend to move around and and they're and so things can change in a dynamic setting. So I think um, there is quite a bit of work that still needs to be done to kind of address the the measurements in those kinds of settings and kind of to improve them. Right. Uh, we haven't. Sorry, Kuros. No, uh, and we had another. We had another question for this one is directed to Neil. Um, several excellent epidemiologists and also the members of the committee for the revision of the WHO. Uh, sorry, her. The WHO um, air quality guidelines try to produce more papers with causal analyses and risk of bias tools for observational studies as a response to the critique that we do not have enough RCTs, instead of coming out to say that these procedures are not always appropriate for environmental health studies. Would you advise taking the second line, um, in other words, coming out and talk about the principles of research? Um, I, I haven't read those reports, but I've heard quite a lot about them, and I know there's been a lot of debate about them, so I can't comment on the reports in, in general, but my impression is that they make the same mistakes as the red meat example I gave, where they end up throwing away a lot of good evidence or, or scoring it very, um, very low um, because the RCT paradigm is, is really held up as the gold standard. Um, but I, I can't comment on them in more um, detail than that. And I, I would say that I've worked with a lot of people trying to think about these methods and think about the um, the problems of using grade and robins for 
uh, evaluating observational studies and much of the motivation comes from um, some of the things that have happened from applying grade to air pollution. Jennifer, if I could comment on, I mean, you know, in air pollution, we have a very well developed body of literature. And so it's possible to, in fact, extend to these other uh, types of analyses. And it's been very helpful to see that, uh, as Neil indicated, it really doesn't make any difference uh, how you analyze these data. Uh, on the other hand, where we have newly developed uh, environmental hazards and the literature is very thin, uh, you know, I think that's where the risk is that, you know, using these approaches and uh, where you have much less data is, is going to allow um, or really hamper our ability to make decisions and, and provide the information for policy decisions. So I'm more concerned about uh, the application of these approaches uh, that Neil describes in uh, other environmental hazards, especially the, the new hazards coming on screen. Thanks all for, our, for your comments. Um, Anamon, do you want to end our session? Yes, I'd like to really thank all the speakers and chairs and all of you participants who have um, hung in there until the end um, with apologies for running over time a little bit but this has been a very stimulating session and discussion with lots of questions uh, generated that we would happy to be happy to pursue in, in the coming weeks and discuss further with any any of you who want to contact us and, and uh, continue the discussion about these important topics um, I'd also like to uh, thank the HCI sponsors who have continued to support our mission and throughout um, the accountability work that we've done and, uh, and other work that we're doing. Um, and finally, let me just say we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar on particle components and associated health effects on April 29. We'll have a sign up for you very soon. Um, we also would really like your feedback on this first webinar in our series. Um, I think there was a great kickoff and uh, we hope we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you very much.